Hey guys, my name is Max Convexity. Thanks for tuning into my channel. I got my little dog right here, Jackson. Say hi, Jackson. It's a beautiful day here in Austin. A great day to shoot a new video, and I have a great topic picked out today. Today's going to kind of be part two of yesterday's topic, Max's Theorem. So we're going to go a little bit more in depth on it, and I'm going to propose a, a new rule of thumb for investing in high yield funds. So stick around and we'll get right into the middle of it. So uh, the first time I made this video or the version one of this video set off a debate in some of the discords I'm in over the relative virtues of growth investing versus income investing. And a lot of people are pro-growth investing, and, and so am I, but we've had a lot of uh, debates, and these investments are definitely income and not growth. And, you know, they don't pretend to be, and they won't compete with growth. Um, yeah, and also, uh, and I said this in the other video too, but I'm, I'm never talking about yellowing. I'm talking about, I'm talking about capital that you're going to invest anyway. That's, I mean, so if people that don't like these, that's fine, but then tell me what you would rather be in. Or, you know, it, I'm not talking about either being in these or, you know, being in nothing. I, I assume I'm always going to invest. I'm just looking for the next best investment at all times. So, you know, um, and I'm also assuming a person isn't already overloaded or whatever. This, I mean, the advice I give in these numbers shouldn't be used for, uh, Yellowing or anything like that. If anything, if you use my, once you understand my rule of thumb, you probably won't want to YOLO much. All right. In the other video, I did conflate NAV return and total return. Um, thank you, Tom, for catching it. The, but the Reader's Digest version of the last video is, if you can estimate the parent asset's return, total return, you can determine the NAV growth or shrinkage of whatever your high yield fund is. So like in a real simple example, S&P is up 50% total return. So then we know the total return of the yield fund will be 50% times whatever their multiplier is for their tracking error. Just to make the math easy, we're going to use that they have 50% tracking error. So that means JEPI in this case would be at 25% on a total return basis. So when we know that, we can subtract JEPI's yield and we can get whatever JEPI's MAB return will be for the year. So in this real simple example, you have an S&P up 50%, you have the yield fund up 25%, but the yield fund's NAV is down 13%. Granted, the yield fund made a 37% dividend, but its NAV was down 13%, the difference being the 25 on the total return basis. Um, all right, so what I was thinking last night is, let's work this equation, we could solve it backwards, and we can solve it for zero NAV movement. In other words, let's see what it would take to have no NAV movement. Okay, think about it. So SPX would have to be a 37.85, which is uh, the percentage, the dividend the JEPI pays. So the the yield, fund, or I'm sorry, the underline would have to be up at least twice that much. Remember, because JEPI on a total return basis only gets half of the, half of whatever the parent gets total return wise. So when you back out the dividend, they need to make at least that dividend, right? And so to be at 0% for the year, the SPX would have to be a 37.85 times 2 for JEPI to have zero NAV. All right, so you just take the yield and double. I mean, that, that's my rule of thumb. So if you have a yield fund that pays 100%, you need the parent to be up 200% on the year, right? I mean, it's not, you know, and that's fine if the fund pays that much. Some, some of them do, like Coney and stuff, but... And those are the ones where the, you know, those are the ones that tend to go up the most also. That's the reason those options are priced so rich is because those kind of stocks can move like that. But, you know, it just makes you think about it. If you need twice the dividend. So 
that that kind of is a good case for like lower dividend stocks, even though a lower dividend stock is no better. But if it only pays 20 percent or something, you only need 40 percent from the parent. I mean, that's not too much to ask for. But, you know, asking for 150, 200 percent is, is crazy. But that's essentially what you're doing. So in my other video, I did say that these ETFs are really uh, just to play on the underlying. I mean, yes, the yield's part of it, but you, you just, you're really dependent on the underlying. Um, let's do another couple of simple examples. So, like I said, an ETF that yields 100, like Coney maybe was doing for a while, they would need Coinbase to be up 200%. Um, if, God forbid, if there's one that did 150%, the parent would have to be up 300%. Um, now, this is the good news for uh, ones like Chip Q is, yeah, they just yield 8, 7, 8, whatever, 12, you know, but that means the parent has a chance of hitting that perspective without, you know, without, ta without the NAV taking a huge hit. So, I mean, it's just something to think about. Um, like even SCHD, what does it pay, 2.5% or something is the Schwab, Schwab growth uh you know, dividend fund that's supposedly a great fund, but it, it pays, you know, two or three percent, but whatever, whatever it pays, you have to double that. But that's not that big of an ask. But even on a fund like that, if, if a fund like that pays, say it pays three percent and uh, the the uh, and the market doesn't move, the S&P is totally flat on the year, whatever the benchmark is. Well, that fund's going to have an abdicate to the tune of three percent. The NAV decay is just the, or the, all that is is the dividend coming out. And we know how much dividends these pay, so all you have to do is subtract the dividend. The dividend is the only thing, I mean, the dividends, we know what it's going to be, or we know pretty close. I use 37.85 on that uh, JEPI example because I just looked at the most recent payment and assumed, you know, that would continue, which may not be a safe assumption, but I just had to have something to go off of. Um, but it's really no more, it's no more complicated than that. You have to, the underlying asset you have to make twice the you need you need twice whatever your dividend it pays from movement in the underlying asset. So these ones that pay 40, you're asking for an 80% up move. That's also why I said in the last video I'm starting to appreciate these yield max ones more. Because single stocks do move up that much all the time. And you know, and like I said in the other video, I was more worried about the downside or whatever. I may have been looking at that wrong. These yield max ones are starting to look better. I still don't like how they aren't diversified, but the, the idea of a Y max is starting to look even even more so attractive. Or or maybe picking out five of these. But you wouldn't want to be in any, you know, you wouldn't want to be, I still don't like the single stock, but I do like the fact that the yield max ones, because a single stock can go up 300% in a year, they do that all the time you know, where the indexes don't. And that's maybe something that I was I was discounting before, but I'm starting to appreciate. Um, but yeah, my overall thesis is there's nothing wrong with these or there's nothing wrong with any fund. Any fund that pays a dividend, the dividend always comes out of NAV. You just have to subtract that out. The reason no one complains about the cheaper funds is because the dividend's so small and the market's usually up and you don't really notice it. But those funds do the same thing as... Uh, is, uh, is these, you know, is the high yield funds. The high yield funds get a bad name for it, and, and understandably, because they have that gigantic payment coming out of, coming out of NAV, you know. Um, okay, so the only variable in the equation, the only thing we don't know is the tracking error component. There, some ETFs are hanging pretty close to the parent and maybe get 70 or 80 percent, you know, uh, and, some, and some get more like 40 or 50 um, okay, check this out. All right, so here's my here's my high yield math sheet from last night. Well, the, in the red box is uh, is the tracking error. This is the percentage of upside that the you know that the yield stock is getting of the parent. Well, that's one's only a hundred because I was comparing the Nasdaq to the triple Qs. Of course, that's a hundred. But let me show you some of the higher ones. Like the triple Q wise was fifty eight percent, and that's respectable. It's about what I expect. Um, IWMY was only 30%. That's a little bit less. Uh, FEPI was 50%. 50% is about what you'd expect. 50% is a good benchmark. And that's why in all these simple examples, I use 50%.
I got a comment yesterday from somebody that say, says, you know, you assume the cover call strategy is going to underperform, but it won't underperform in a, in a down market. And I thought about that, and it won't. Uh, but so, yeah, you shouldn't just assume it's going to always underperform the cover call strategy. It can, but I guess over any course of time is maybe what that means. I need to do research that a little bit, but I think maybe over 10 years it's going to underperform. But if we hit a two-year bear market, yeah, it, it would outperform for those two years. And even in a sideways market, it, it can outperform just anything but a straight-up market. But... You know, but we get the straight up market so often, it's sometimes we forget about other markets, I guess. But uh, who knows? Maybe it'll switch soon. I hope not. But uh, all right. So, yeah, it's, it's a dangerous assumption to assume anything always does anything. Um, OK, yeah, this is just a rule of thumb. And I like this rule of thumb. I think it's somewhat related to my other rule of thumb that says to prevent NAV erosion, invest two thirds of the dividend back in. They're the same principle. If you're investing two-thirds of the dividend back in, well, the bigger the dividend you get is, the more you have to put back in. And, of course, now we know from this rule, the bigger the dividend is, the, the more the NAV is going to decay. But anyway, so as the NAV is decaying, you're buying additional shares at progressively lower prices with, with, you know, with the two-thirds of the dividend, which isn't totally bad news. You still have one-third left over for yourself. When you have these things that pay 60% and you have one-third left over, that's a 20%. I mean, other other fixed income investments don't pay 20% that, that I know of. But this rule of thumb, and just like the other rule of thumb, the two-thirds rule of thumbs, they're good rule of thumbs, but neither of them are guarantees of thumb. You could, you could invest two-thirds, reinvest two-thirds of your dividend back into some of these uh, high-yield funds that have gone straight down, and you would still be underwater so that it doesn't bail you out all the time. It just means on average, if you invest two thirds, you ought to be all right because there's sometimes your funds going up also, and you you know, and you're investing. So it should all even out in the wash is, is the principle of it. Um, but just to be safe, if we haven't talked about a buffer ranking yet, or until I release them, when you're just doing figuring in your head, figure on fifty percent. You figure you're going to get with the cover call strategy fifty percent. Now some of them, you know, if you want to do seventy five percent, if you have iSpy. Well, yeah, go for it. And I'm going to release the higher rankings. There's some ones that do get have more juice in them for sure. But it, if until we talk about a specific ranking for your fund, just use 50%. And that's a good way. At least you'll know what to expect out of your NAV. Now, I'm not saying the NAV decay is a bad thing. Total returns, total return. If it's up 25% on the year, like in the JEPI example, I don't care if the NAV is down 13%. It's up 25%. I mean, who cares? I'm not making a judgment call saying you need to go for funds that have less NAV erosion. Some people are really don't like to see NAV erosion in their account or whatever, and I guess no one likes to see it. But anyway, if that's if that's something you prioritize in your investing, then you could you you could definitely you know use JEPQ or maybe iSpy or you know there's a lot of ones out there, not a lot, but there's a few out there that that have you know that have a lot more upside. The Goldman Sachs ones look really good as well. Now there's a caveat to that. <laughs> They're going to also have more downside in the bear market. I mean, there's no getting around it, but these but these funds right now are, are doing great and uh, they're killing it. They're killing it. Um, okay, but here's another thing I was thinking when I was jotting down notes on my slide, I just remembered. So, you know, that's great if you have a 100% yielder and hell, some of these stocks can go up well more than that, even if you think, yeah, the stock can maybe be up that much. You know, you aren't worried about it or whatever. But then the, th the whole thing is, yeah, why not just buy the stock 200% in a year? You know, if you knew the stock was going to be up 200% in a year, you just buy the stock. I mean, that's a lot of money, you know, even though you're going to make 100 with the cover call route. Um the thing is, you don't, you never know it's going to be up 200% in the year. It's easy to, it's easy when you look at last year to think that, but you have no idea. And that's why the cover call route gives you better average performance and better long term performance, risk adjusted and stuff. Because also remember about my, about my theorem and stuff. If, if the, if the index or whatever the parent company is has a bad year, these only get part of the bad year also. Like I've made the example during COVID, how the market was off about a third more than these than the cover call funds were. There's that there's a pretty significant buffer in there. 
the daily funds will be buffered about a half. But in any event, um, if if you have a if you have a, a parent asset that's down fifty percent on the year, the yield fund's just down twenty five percent. So then, if the yield fund pays a fifty percent dividend, then uh, their NAV change is negative twenty five. Uh, plus 50. Well, anyway, it's negative 75 on the year. Their NAV's going to be down 75% on the year. Now, that's the bad news. Their total returns is good. It's only down 25%. That still sucks, but the, this is in a year the S&P's down 50%. But the rule works both ways. It's not It's not just a one-way rule. So, buffers, buffer is a bad thing on the way, I mean, a good thing on the way up. You want less buffer on the way up and more buffer on the way down. Um, this comes back to the growth first income debate. You know, why not just get the parent asset? I mean, and, and I get that, and I get that. I, I think that a lot of people, the way a lot of people solve this problem also is they have, this is what the 60-40 portfolio is for. You have 60 in growth, usually stocks, and then 40 in, in usually bonds. I'm saying nowadays I think you could do 80 and then 20 in these, not financial advice, and, and, and kick the bonds to the curb. Even with the bad things these do or whatever, they're still, you know, you can, they still have a decent total return. Um, if you can tolerate the NAV situation, um, if you can't, you can always go for one of the, one of the lower ones. Um, you know, I mean, Jeff Q's looks, the more you look at Jeff Q, I mean, how can anyone not like Jeff Q or Jeff I for that matter? They're, you know, they're great funds. Uh, I prefer the daily funds. I've told you a million times, but there's nothing wrong with Jeff Q or Jeff I. Remember, guys, not financial advice at all, fun and entertainment only. I hope you've had fun and been entertained, and if so, please hit the like. Subscribe if you haven't already. Tell a friend, tell a neighbor. Now, I seriously, I appreciate it. Um, be looking for the videos. I'll release the rankings pretty soon on the MC Buffer number. We won't say the tracking error anymore, and from now on, it's going to be Buffer. So uh, I'll have those numbers out within a, within a few days. And I'm also working on some review videos right now on a few new, new funds or proposed funds. Anyway, that, that'll be out as well soon. So keep an eye out for that. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.